Okay, so wrong direction. Let's continue. Next big one is uh, wireless communication. So big issue here is that it's unpredictable. So the th throughput might go down. The the availability might might be spotty. Um, we have that trade-off again with energy consumption, which I already mentioned a few times. Um, usually the size of the media we actually want to, to consume is a lot, uh, is growing a lot more faster than uh, we have bandwidth available. So you can't currently stream a 4K video over, over mobile connections, at least not very well. Um, it might work for full HD by now, but uh, the media uh, media formats have already advanced to to basically the next stage. Um, due to the spotty availability, the actual quality of your service might very change very quickly. So, right in the middle of your video stream, for example, and um, what on a on a different note than bandwidth, we also have the round trip time. So, the amount it takes to get a message to the server and get the response pa back. And that might, even if you have a high bandwidth, the round trip time might still be very high and sometimes too high to do any kind of really interactive stuff. So the, the rule of thumb is that anything above 100 milliseconds of round trip time will already feel laggy and slow to the user. Maybe even 70 milliseconds. And that's actually not that easy to get on, on mobile networks. So now let's briefly look at the basics of wireless, trans wireless transmission. So just very brief look into signal theory and transmissions, uh, what different kinds of wireless networks we have, and also what the, uh, the software stack uh, looks like. Um, so the really fundamental basics of signal transmission are that we have a cell with a single transmitter or transceiver in the center. And you could subdivide that into three regions. So we have the transmission region where you can actually communicate with the transmitter. Then with increasing distance, you get the recognition region where you can still uh, detect that the transmitter is somewhere near, but you can't really communicate anymore. And we have the interference region where you still get some bit of signal from the transmitter, but it's so, uh, it's so low that you can't actually recognize it as a valid signal anymore, but it will still generate noise. So if you try to receive some other transmitter, which is nearby, then you have to separate out this additional noise from the signal and uh, so not to, to get any interference in the, in the long run. Um, so what we're looking at mostly is communication with electromagnetic waves in the, at the most fundamental level and the, the frequency range we're mostly going to deal with is somewhere between 500 megahertz and 5 gigahertz. So there are uh, different research projects which look into communication with uh, visible light, for example, or terahertz waves, which is ongoing research but not something which we uh, can use practically at the moment. And we have Two, two main factors which determine how much we can actually transmit over a given wireless channel. We have the so-called bandwidth, um, which is usually uh, in megahertz. UMTS has, for example, 60 megahertz for one channel. And um, that's limited by several factors. So it gets more expensive and more complicated to build hardware with high bandwidth for, uh, for one channel. And you also only get limited uh, um, bandwidth assigned by the regulators, which you can actually use for your applications. Um, and the other aspect, independent of the bandwidth kind of, is the modulation method. So if you have a very old radio, then you will notice it has a switch AM, FM, for example, amplitude modulation or frequency modulation. These are the most primitive forms of modulation, which radio, just analog broadcast radio, has been using for, I guess, 100 years by now or even longer. Um, and which are still in use because they are very simple to implement, but of course you don't get a very high bandwidth using these modulation methods. And for that reason, you uh, also have digital modulation methods which directly encode a bitstream into the, the signal. Um, we're going to, to look into that in more detail in a, in a, a further, uh, upcoming lecture. 
but uh, one example which is often used is so-called quadrature amplitude modulation, QAM, and a wide array of different, different sub-modulations of that, uh, of that method. So um, how, is that, how does that look if we illustrate it a little? So um, for example, here we have the uh, wireless spectrum between 1800 and 2200 megahertz. And then um, we have different assigned bands. So for example, UMTS band one is what's used in the US and South, South America. Uh, it has two big bands, both 60 megahertz wide, uh, uplink and downlink, so communication phone to base station and communication base station to phone backwards. Uh, in Europe and Asia, we have band two, so uh, different band assignments, basically same bandwidth, but um, different locations in the spectrum, just due to local regulations. Um, this is a band, then again, the bandwidth, already mentioned that for the whole band. And we also have stuff called white space, which is an unassigned spectrum in between the bands. Uh, so if we look into one band's band in more detail, then we get different channels. I don't actually know the exact number now for UMTS, but it's subdivided into multiple channels, of course, and each channel in itself also has a channel bandwidth, which is basically just the whole bandwidth divided by the number of channels, and it has a so-called center frequency. So uh, if I talk about a channel at, I don't know, uh, 1975 megahertz, then this is the center frequency. And I will always have uh, a certain bandwidth basically to the left and right, which is also claimed by that, by that channel. So an example of how that actually looks like is here. So you can see uh, it's quite, quite intensely contested. So this is basically the whole wireless spectrum. Um, so we have two gigahertz here. Uh, it go, goes on with three gigahertz here, up to 30 gigahertz, 300 gigahertz, and you have an in, insane amount of, of different uh, band and channel assignments for various purposes. So the UMTS stuff we were just talking about is probably uh, located somewhere in here uh, between 300 meg uh, megahertz and th uh, three gigahertz. So if you zoom in far enough, then you can somewhere find the UMTS bands in here. And there's a huge amount of assignments uh, for different, uh, different services, for TV, uh, for the different mobile networks, for emer emergency services, satellite communication. So it's uh, insanely crowded. And you usually you're not allowed to transmit anything at all with a wireless transmitter unless it, you actually have a license for that and your band is somewhere uh, allocated somewhere in here. There are some exceptions. Um, I already mentioned most of this. Oh, ah, okay, I, I skipped over that, sorry. Um, important uh, is that due to this contested nature of the whole spectrum, then we need some kind of arbitration scheme. So you can't have just one single transmitter on one channel at the same time. Um, and usually, so you need some way to share a channel and you either do it by, again, subdividing that into different frequency slots or you do it by time sharing. So only one device is allowed to transmit at a time. Because in most cases, if two devices transmit simultaneously, then you won't be able to separate out the signals anymore at the receiver. You get interference just like we saw earlier and um, yeah, it will just overlap. Um, so, yeah, that's the signal to noise ratio. Already mentioned that briefly. You ha have the signal you want to actually uh, separate out from everything you receive and you have a certain noise level. And if the noise level gets too high, you can't separate it anymore. And noise can have very uh, large amount of different sources. So you can have uh, other transmitters, of course. You can also have thermal noise. So if the, transmit if the, the receiver starts to get hot, then it will internally uh, generate noise. You actually have stuff like uh, cosmic background radiation. You can also pick that up with the radios. And um, all of that combines to uh, give you a bad signal to noise ratio because 
of course, you want a high one. Signal should be very at a high level. Noise should be at a very low level. And you need some way to separate the two. Um, one way to actually do that is why an antenna. Antennas have uh, different characteristics. So um, they have a preferred frequency, of course, or a frequency range, which they can, um, can uh, transmit and receive. They're usually symmetrical, so they're just as well suited to transmit and to receive. Um, and you can, of course, use that to, um, to separate out part of the noise by uh, focusing on one specific frequency band, for example. Then they have a so-called gain. That's basically how efficient they are at receiving. And what's important, they also have uh, different radiation patterns. So depending on the geometry of the antenna itself, you also get different geometries in the uh, reception uh, strength. So, for example, this is a, a horn antenna which is kind of shaped like, like a pyramid, like a, like a funnel. And this has a very strong um, reception and transmission gain in one single direction. Um, on the other hand, here we have a dipole antenna, which has a very symmetrical um, pattern in all different directions, um, <laughs> except for the axis on which the, the dipole is oriented. The dipole actually is just more or less just a piece of wire. So this is the most simple antenna you can actually have. And this is, has a very nice symmetrical pattern all around. Uh, so it can receive from, from all directions equally well, except for, for the axis of the dipole itself. Uh, does anyone have an idea why, you, why would you actually want to use something like the, the horn antenna? So what's a, what's a use case for that which you could think of? Anyone has an idea? Yeah, estimating the di direction is a good point. So you could, could use it to pinpoint something um, and to reduce noise, also a good point. Um, one application would, for example, be if you have a direct wireless link between two buildings. That happens quite often. So you want, for example, to, uh, I think, for example, some of the uh, student living quarters here in the city do have that because they don't have a, a wired connection to uh, the university, but they still w should be on the university network. So you set up a, a wireless link from roof to roof. And of course, you don't need, don't need to broadcast in all directions for, the, for that. You would only need one single direction. On the other hand, of course, if you put such, an, such a horn antenna in a mobile, then that probably wouldn't work very well because you would actually have to point at the, the base station or the router for that to work. Um, in theory, for mobile devices, you would want some kind of ideal uh, omnidirectional antenna, which receives equally well in any direction, so it doesn't matter at all how you turn your device. Um, that's not possible physically, but you can kind of simulate it if you use multiple different antennas with different orientations. So for example, if you have two dipole antennas which are oriented perpendicular to each other, then you could already start to simulate that. Of course, the receiver would have to know that and select the right antenna depending on the signal to noise ratio. So it would always use the one where the ratio is better and switch between them, them dynamically. And that's basically how just about every mobile device works now. They have multiple antennas and dynamically change between them. All right. So um, another look at what, what we have to do deal with in terms of, of wireless communication from a physical point of view. So we have lots of physical effects like um, refraction, reflection, all of them, absorption, absorption, diffraction, they all combine to lower, in the end, lower the signal to noise ratio. So some materials will absorb wireless uh, signals, some materials will reflect them and direct them out of the window, basically. Um, all of this put together uh, will somehow yeah, lower your, your signal strength, basically. Um, you have also you have stuff like interference. This is uh, 
more important because um, if you look for example at the example with the two antennas again, if they basically try to transmit on the same wavelength to get better, um, yeah, better signal to noise ratio again, then uh, they might actually start to cancel each other out. So this is, uh, if you, maybe you remember that from your physics classes, if you have two waves overlapping, then they might actually increase in strength if they're in phase or they might cancel out if they're out of phase. And if you have multiple antennas or maybe even multiple different mobile devices transmitting at the same frequency, then you might also get that kind of interference effect. And finally, if you take uh, reflection, for example, uh, and refraction into account, then you might get so-called multipath scattering. That means that you have different physical paths. So for example, from my mobile device to the router up there, of course, I have a direct line of sight, so that's the most direct path. But I might also get a reflection on, for example, on the, the steel mesh in the walls. And I get different paths over, um, over different reflective surfaces, for example. And in, in the first place, of course, this is again bad because it will lower the signal to noise ratio. But if you have receivers which are, and, and transceivers which are actually optimized for that sort of thing, which have, for example, several antennas, uh, again, most of the current ones now have that, then they can tune one single antenna to one specific pathway and use them all together to actually get a, a bigger bandwidth than you would get with only one single direct path. So this is something which can actually be used to our, our advantage. <laughs>